A top-notch sprint is a symphony of motion, a delicate interplay between power and precision. One critical element in sprinting technique involves hitting the ground with high precision, as speed is a direct result of this action. An 11-second sprinter spends 50% of the race time in contact with the ground, meaning that they stand in place for 5.5 seconds. In comparison, during his 100-meter world record performance, Usain Bolt spent on the ground only 4 seconds. Since everyone spends about the same amount of time in the air, it turns out that most of a sprinter's progress comes from reducing the ground contact time. So reducing each contact time by just one hundredth of a second, a sprinter can achieve a one-tenth of a second improvement per 10 strides. That's very easy to accomplish by fixing the last 20 meters of the race, because it's the most overlooked part. Although everyone knows that speed is a product of the vertical force applied to the ground, deep down, it is very hard to accept. Most sprinters feel the urge to push the track backward, believing it will make them faster. However, at top speed, it becomes impossible to do so because the sprinter, due to elastic recoil from tendons, literally bounces off the ground like a ball. Since tendons contract several times faster than muscles, pushing the ground backward during elastic recoil is as pointless as trying to push the bowstring forward to accelerate the arrow. The bounce of the ball begins at the moment when the elastic tension reaches a greater degree than the compression force. Similarly, for a powerful bounce, the sprinter must strike the ground right underneath the center of their body mass, while maintaining the whole body as rigid as a steel rod. At the same time, the lower leg muscles must produce high enough tension on ground contact to become stiffer than the attached tendon. From there on, elastic recoil occurs about three hundredths of a second after the initial ground contact. This process, like the bounce of the ball, is completely automatic, and it happens so quickly that it's impossible to control consciously. Understanding this clarifies the timing to push and ease off, much like drawing and releasing an arrow. The key indicator of elastic recoil is the rising of the heel, marking the time to relax and prepare for the next touchdown. At this point, if you're still pushing, you're wasting your time and energy. Unfortunately, that's what most sprinters tend to do in the latter stages of any sprint race, and it's reflected on their faces. The fact that sprinters overpush, even in the World Championships finals, shows that they don't believe it's the vertical force that generates speed. In critical moments, people do what they believe works best for them. Surprisingly, even elite sprinters believe it's the backward push. Otherwise, they would do what maximizes their speed. To confirm conclusively that the vertical force is the major contributor to speed, let's examine straight leg bounds. This drill closely simulates sprinting and upon performing it, it becomes evident that speed results from the combination of the downward push and the forward swing of the free leg. There is no horizontal push whatsoever. This becomes even clearer when performing the bounds on ice, as any force in the horizontal direction causes slipping. However, regardless of how fast you start the bounds, there will be no loss of footing because the majority of the applied force is directed downward and the forward swing of the free leg effectively converts the elastic rebound into horizontal velocity. Sprinting operates on the same principle, so focusing on hitting the ground underneath your center of mass and accurately easing off will make you run faster in the second half of the race by at least one-tenth of a second.